Hi, everyone. This is Elena Pepe Salutric from ALA's Public Programs Office, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. ALA's Sarah Jafarian Award presents Teaching the Tulsa Race Massacre with Guided Inquiry Design. Next slide, please. Before we start, I just want to make a few quick notes. Today's webinar is presented by the Public Programs Office with support from the Cultural Communities Fund. This webinar has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Democracy Demands Wisdom. Sorry, <laughs> can you go back to the last slide again? Um, we hope that you um, are aware of programminglibrarian.org, um, a website of the Public Programs Office. Programming Librarian has an online learning um, library full of free webinars just like this one. We hope you'll check it out after today's webinar. Next slide, please. A few quick notes about our digital classroom. Um, first, only presenters have microphone access, um, but you are welcome to drop any comments or questions in our chat. To access chat, please navigate to the bottom of the screen and click the chat window. If you have any questions um, or need any technical support, you can also use our Q&A feature. Um, to access the Q&A feature, please go to the bottom of the window and click the Q&A icon. Please put your chat questions here um, just so that they don't get missed in, I mean, please put your technical questions here so that they don't get missed in the chat window. Next slide, please. With that, I'm excited to introduce today's webinar. Shawnee Middle School in Shawnee, Oklahoma was selected as the 2021 winner of the Sarah Jafarian School Library Program Award for Exemplary Humanities Programming. Their program, the Tulsa Race Massacre, Assumptions Cause Conflict in Society, was unanimously selected by the Sarah Jafarian Award Committee for its strong connection to learning standards and meaningful programming around an important historical topic that is still relevant to today. I'd like to introduce our presenter for this afternoon, Carol Jones. Carol Jones has been a librarian in Austin, Texas, Champaign, Illinois, Mount Vernon, Georgia, and Shawnee, Oklahoma. She has taught students from pre-K through adult. The school types have varied from a bilingual dual language urban elementary school to a rural high school in a rurally situated prison. Her current situation in Shawnee serves a middle school population of 750 students, where one third are citizens of tribal nations. In each situation, her students have taught her far more than she teaches them. She is most thrilled when students and teachers see the great experience that student-led research can be. And before we begin, I just want to note that any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the American Library Association. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Carol Jones. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to share this information with you. I do get a lot of questions about it, so let's just jump right in. Uh, just a few background points, um, just because questions come up when I've presented on this before. Um, guided inquiry is obviously inquiry-based learning, and so I'll talk a little bit about that, just, just a tiny uh, bit. The Tulsa Race Massacre, in case you're not aware of that event in history, I'll give a small background on that. And then Wakelet as a curation tool is a big part of this particular unit and the way that we um, disseminate information to students. And then I'll give you a few details about our building too that might affect the webinar, we hope not. All right, so inquiry-based learning. Um, the big push on this is that teachers really become a guide and that's basically where the terminology in guided inquiry came to from um, in that the teacher is guiding students, um, advising students, and maybe making suggestions, but students are actually the choice makers as far as what they want to investigate. Um, students then uh, lead into number two, where they're really driving what it is they're researching and um, concerned about. And just with that buy-in, it means that students kind of have more um, more invested, so they spend more time and more quality in what they're actually doing. Um, the other thing that kind of sometimes three and four kind of go together, teachers are used to having the answer and then students become used to the teacher having the right answer, quote unquote right answer. 
and there isn't always one correct answer. And so that kind of leads into some discomfort and that specifically is addressed in the blog that, that we shared in February about this particular unit that there's, there's some uncomfortableness with not always having that right answer or not always um, knowing exactly where your students are gonna go with this particular um, approach to student learning. If you want to know more, there are two different links there. One is Edutopia recently had a great thing about a brand new teacher to, uh, to inquiry-based learning. And then there's a link to the guided inquiry blog as well. The Tulsa Race Massacre is not something that lots and lots of people know about, mainly because the uh, city of Tulsa and the state of Oklahoma did a fabulous job of covering it up. And so it was not until very recently that the state of Oklahoma made it a required part of uh, Oklahoma history and to just make sure that this information was not continuing to be covered up. And so this happened in 1921 from May 31st into the night and into the day of the next day, June 1st. Basically, um, gunfire was exchanged between two mobs of men, and um, both of them were there for different reasons. One was there for the protection of a young man who was accused of sexually assaulting a, a white woman. And um, at the point that those two mobs interacted, somebody in some way fired a shot from a gun. And um, there's still debates about who, about why, about how that first shot happened. Uh, we just know that it happened and it ended up with um, then of course an exchange of gunfire and with most of Greenwood, also known commonly as Black Wall Street, being burned um, from bombing in planes and also just from um, hand torches, that kind of thing. So there were many residents killed in the neighborhood of Greenwood. An exact number is not known. Um, many were buried without, um, without graves and that kind of thing. So there were, there's just not an exact number. The city of Tulsa did take great pains to cover this up. They did many things to withhold either legal or monetary or even just physical resources for people to be able to rebuild their homes or businesses. So um, they also denied the truth for decades that it even happened. Um, but of course, then there had been newspaper um, articles about it. So once that went national, then there was not as much cover up that, as they, that they could do, but then they denied that they had ever said they would make restitution. Um, Greenwood residents did come together and rebuild their neighborhood to a very prosperous level into the 50s and 60s, and it continued to do well, um, self-sufficiently, until um, the city decided to put I-244 through there in 1967. So there's an article about 244, and there's a picture, or I thought there was a picture, there it is. Um, showing basically Main Street in Greenwood, and then you can see across the street, uh, there's churches and other uh, community buildings, and so 244 runs right through the middle of uh, downtown, really, or the middle of Greenwood's neighborhood, and so that actually changed some of the dynamics of that growth. All right, then Wakelet, we use Wakelet as a place to gather and kind of sort resources for students to continue their own research. We don't require them to continue the research into the massacre or even um, anything to deal with racism or prejudices or that kind of thing. The only parameters we put on them they're going to research something where they see assumptions still taking place. Um, then we gather lots and lots of resources that might help them or that might give them ideas in this wakelet. And um, it's really just a, a um, digital curation tool where you would track things that students might refer to. Then some general details that have been asked, again, like I said, after presentations I've given before, we spend about eight weeks on this unit, give or take, kind of depends on the specifics of that year. Our first year, we say we had flumageddon, so that actually um, added a little bit of time for some students. And then, of course, last year, well, uh, yeah, last year there was COVID, um, so when there's normal time periods, it's about eight weeks. 
Uh, we do have two blocks of time with our students. They have an English class period and a literature class period. So that might affect how you would uh, implement this. Uh, we also post many lessons, things that I might normally push into the classroom and, and visit over one day since we've had in the past students out for whatever reason, we wanna make sure that they still have access to that information uh, to view it again or to review it if they've not seen it. Uh, so I did like many lessons on plagiarism, keyword searching, and then also tracking where you visited and what kind of information you got from that source. Then our administration has been very supportive from the very beginning when we began guided inquiry and began implementing it in the building. So um, that does help greatly. And then all grade levels in our building use guided inquiry. So our eighth graders at this point should have seen it and experienced the the kind of flow of steps, at least in sixth grade and seventh grade. So by the time they reach us, our hope is that they're uh, proficient enough that we're not just teaching the process, we're just using the process. And then the very last thing is our school bells, the thing to change periods, sound a lot like um, a fire alarm or something that you should respond to. So nobody needs to panic, but if you hear it, that's what it is. Okay, so this is basically a unit for student research and I subtitled this from struggling to soaring. Our first experience out of the gate with guided inquiry um, didn't go as um, wonderfully as we had hoped, um, mainly because I think teachers were that whole discomfort thing I was talking to you about, that uh, they were not as, um, ready for it maybe as, as we were by the next year after we got some training from the author of, of this particular unit and this particular process. Um, and she offers that training even now virtually. So it's wonderful to kind of get that guidance and that made all the difference for us. Okay, so I have a poll for you. If you um, have never heard about the Tulsa Race Massacre, then you would answer, one in the poll. So I'm just starting to explore that or I know some facts and I want ideas to help me use this with my students. Um, I've already started teaching it number three in the last year or number four, I've taught it for a number of years or number five, I actually have family who have lived it. So if you would quickly answer that as a poll. All right, let's go back. And I'm not sure where we would see the poll, but. So it should be sharing results, but you might not see it on your end. It looks like okay. just about half say, I know some facts and I want to ideas to introduce to my students. Okay. Um, and then the next highest one was, I'm just starting to explore the details with a few people saying they've taught it for years. Okay, okay. That's kind of where I thought everybody would land. Thank you, Atlanta. All right, so this is the actual book that we um, use as far as kind of getting ideas about how we're gonna implement this and what we went through. The nice thing about um, having Leslie lead us through um, planning this unit was that we actually, as teachers, when, when she um, leads you through the unit, you actually, you walk through the steps yourself. And I think that really made mentally a big shift for us so that we could then see this working with students. And it was incredible the difference in in implementation after we had some hands-on training that, um, it would just, I think the comfort level for us was better, but it also gave us the confidence to then implement it even with team, people on our team who had not been able to be at the training. So when you look at the steps for guided inquiry, it's interesting that several of them overlap somewhat, and then you have explore and identify that almost look like you're doing some backtracking. And I'll talk to you about that when we get to the specifics of those steps, because honestly, um, there are students and kind of mentally when you're doing research, um, 
you may need to revise. And so that explore and identify might drop you back some technically in the process, but uh, it's probably because you're reevaluating some of those sources and reevaluating the information you got from them. And so we, you'll see that we have students who actually did that. So we start this unit and we're starting it basically um, right now, the week before Thanksgiving and going into uh, Christmas or going into the week after Thanksgiving in December. We started with the first Thanksgiving, this painting that was done actually of supposedly Thanksgiving in 1621. And we talk through that with students. Uh, we use some of the plan tips from the Stanford History Education Group. And um, there's a lesson that I have linked for you uh, with this particular painting, because it, it's pretty incredible for students to normally look at something like this and not think twice about it, because they can identify right away what the painting is supposed to be showing. But when you start talking to them about how did this guy who painted this in 1932 have any idea what was really happening, then, then they realize the mental models that we're just relying on as truth and that those things probably aren't what really happened. Um, then the other book that some of our classes use for this open piece to get people thinking is Smoky Night by Eve Bunting, which is based on the riots that happened after the Rodney King verdict. The other thing that we then have students look through is um, this site particularly uh, talks about assumptions that people might make about another person as far as not necessarily a an event or anything but like this first one a student says that everybody assumes since she's six feet tall or a little bit over that she plays basketball and she basically goes into this description that she doesn't really even like basketball but everybody assumes that's what she does and then um the next one, kind of the opposite, that everybody assumes that because I'm a short person, then I must have this great complex about it. And the student says, actually, I don't. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm just who I am. So um, that particular exercise helps students see that, one, we do make assumptions when we see people, but uh, very often those things can be harmful. So that's kind of what we're trying to lead to for them to then start identifying where they want to do research when they see that particular thing happening, even still. All right, so this open phase then is really just meant to hook students. It's meant to start them thinking, like in kindergarten or first grade, um, teachers might say, we need you to put your thinking caps on because this is really what we're hoping for them is that one, they're thinking. And again, this is also where we're trying to open that um, different process where they're not expecting the teacher to one, even give them the question, but two, have the quote unquote right answer. And so they get it that they're, they're developing the question, they're developing what it is that they think is important to find out, but then they're also going to be the one looking for the answer. Okay, immerse is where you're going to dig deeper. And there's many aspects that we're digging deeper in with this unit and we want them to know the history we want them to know the background that like greenwood was this prospering city it was very self-sufficient it was made up of professionals who were well trained and educated and the city itself or that part of the city they had their own lawyers they had schools they had churches they had uh, funeral homes they had stores they had basically everything that was needed and that's why it became referred to as black wall street is because it was so prosperous and that prosperity came from many of um the uh, much of the money that was made in Tulsa at the time was based on oil. And so a lot of the people who actually became independently wealthy was based on the oil that was available in this area. And so um, there were many people of all races who did well because of that. And so then uh, O.W. Gurley especially started um, Tulsa or Greenwood and had hoped to specifically build a city that would be sufficient and um, with only members who were African-American so that they wouldn't be reliant on anybody beyond themselves. 
So that's one of the things that we try to make sure students realize that Greenwood was built to be a prosperous part of the city and was also built to be self-sufficient so that they get it that um, maybe that was the root of some of the jealousy that might have caused um, the what was at the time referred to as the Tulsa race riots at the time. Then we also have these panels that kind of dig deeper into the history that all of the students we have work on this particular strategy called an optic strategy, where they examine all the panels. We borrowed these panels from the Tulsa Historical Society. The nice thing about uh, borrowing them from this particular resource is one, we could use them for 10 days, but uh, we could physically have them in our library, but they also have them posted online. And that way, anybody who wants to use them anywhere in the nation can use them. Thankfully, we do have a set now. You can see them behind me um, that the K-20 Center actually purchased a set for our school. So we are very thankful that we are not limited now by that 10 day um, borrowing window. Uh, what we do in the optic strategy, though, is we have students, after they've examined all the panels, then choose one picture that they want to examine more deeply and where they want to answer those questions on that particular um, worksheet that a teacher um, put together. And they're going to actually take a picture of the picture they're choosing to focus on. They're going to then um, go through those where they, they basically write down, what do you observe? What do you actually see happening in that picture? And then it asks them, what do you think the photographer, why did they choose that particular um, either central subject or central building or central what it is that you feel like they were drawn to photograph? And then there's some other questions there on that particular um, sheet. And it's amazing that the students spend a long time um, trying to decide what part of history uh, these, these pictures are portraying and what it is that they think motivated the photographers of these pictures. Then as you go deeper into um, the research, you move from kind of immerse where you're just kind of looking at everything and uh, we want them to come become a little more specific. And so this is a picture of our wakelet in the middle. Um, we started this unit with a whole class read of Dreamland Burning. And that's kind of where some of the information that we, that we chose to focus on began and um, where we really felt like students would want to do some of their own research. I will say that we have kind of tweaked that this year and we want students to have more choice and we have literature circles now where they can choose from Green, Dreamland Burning or they can choose Angel of Dream, uh, Greenwood um, Dear Martin, uh, All American, uh, Almost American Girl, and This Is My America, and then Stamped, the version for kids, and Unspeakable, a picture book about the massacre, and Opal's Greenwood Oasis. So basically, we want them to be able to choose, and then the last one is Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down graphic novel. Um, but we want them to have some choice in what it is they're examining more deeply for this unit. And we want them to, again, have more ownership in which particular way they're taking their research. This wakelet, though, is, uh, well, I thought I had another slide, but I don't. Um, the wakelet has all kinds of things where students are seeing assumptions. So there may be things about, um, I know there's some things on the, um, on homelessness, there's some things on um, using marijuana because there was medical marijuana was on the ballot at the time in Oklahoma. Then there's some things on like Cameron Russell's TED talk there on basically what is beauty and what the definition of beauty is in our country. And then she also talks about how students need to, again, dig deeper and there's one of our bells. Um, basically use their own uh, intellect to make choices. And so she actually kind of puts it to them and they talk about that particular TED talk um, more than almost anything they view in this particular unit. The other things that they'll find there are things that deal with just greater issues. Like um, there were, there's even some 
current events like last year was when the Capitol riots happened. Um, right now, there are some links to the Ahmaud Aubrey trial. So we try to keep things that are that are very current events, but also where assumptions are at work. Then they move from that exploring and um, kind of digging around to trying to be more specific in what am I actually going to keep digging for? So in this particular point, we want them to move from still gathering information that, that may or may not be used to being more specific as in what do you want to actually research? And this is actually probably the hardest part for them because many of them, I think, find some things they find interesting, but I don't know if it's they don't want to commit or if they're having trouble maybe fashioning a question. And so that tends to be, this tends to be the hardest step for them to identify and pinpoint a specific question that they want to continue their research on. I will say that then when we ask them to reflect on what helped you the most, this journaling piece, we have them journal from the very beginning where they just do a quick write of three to five sentences when somebody made an assumption about you. And um, that journaling piece, they refer back to quite a bit that, that helped them make their decisions and help them track how they were doing. Then this is also where we do the mini lessons that kind of have the mechanics of things like the keyword searching the tracking as in almost, almost leaving breadcrumbs for yourself so that you know what it was that was valuable in that particular resource and what it was that um, you were actually finding at that particular resource. And so I try to be specific with them and show them some places that I might have researched, but then also model for them what would I have written down about that particular site so that they kind of get it when we're saying you need to track all your sources, you need to track all your research, what it is they're tracking. And then I try to tell them that the reason for that is we want you to be able to go back to that source if maybe you change your question enough that now that source that you thought you weren't going to use, you now end up needing to use. And so I teach them that that saying um, this source didn't work for me is really not descriptive enough. You need to say specifically, what did you really find at this resource? And um, if you think it will fit and help you answer your research question, what are the pieces that you think it's going to answer? And then if you don't think it's gonna work, maybe there's enough there that you probably should write down or at least make notes of as to what was at that site in case you do come back to it and decide you want to use it after all. The other thing, there's a, a painting there by Paul Revere that ends up in a lot of textbooks. Um, however, Paul Revere actually plagiarized that, stole it from a friend who had created a lithograph lithographic plate of that and wanted Paul to print it for him. However, then uh, within the month, Paul had this painting that was remarkably like this guy's um, plate. And uh, anyway, the, there's this letter from the friend saying, I can't believe you did this. And uh, we're not friends anymore. And everything that that you've borrowed from my mother, you need to return. <laughs> and so he basically just ends their friendship based on uh, Paul Revere having stole his his intellectual work. OK, so the gathering phase is also where students often refer back to the Wakelet because now they have identified their question, they've narrowed it down, and they, um, they now need specific information to support their answering, their, to support them actually coming to answers about their question. So they're not just getting general information now, they're actually going a good bit um, more specific and deeper into their, whatever their question was. And here, I knew I had a slide that had more pictures of what was on the Wakelet. On the Wakelet, we do have things that are specific to the massacre. And so we have like um, newspaper articles that, that talked about it from both sides and that talked about it from both sets of papers. But also we have things like you'll see in the middle there that looks like a piece of notebook paper. That's actually an arrest record. And so students, 
look through that and see that there's like three arrest records for white people and then hundreds for black people. And so it's not one of those things that that you realize when you're just reading the newspapers, but these specific primary sources actually show a different picture. Um, and so students actually spend some time, especially if they want to do further research on the massacre itself. We also have links to videos like the survivor stories that the um, Race Riot Commission um, recorded back in, I think it was 2000. 99 into 2000. After they've gathered their information, uh, we let students know that they are going to choose what, how they want to present their project. And so we have, they can make a poster, like um, an infographic, they can choose to do a video. Some of them do podcasts, some of them do um, basically a slideshow presentation and some opt to do, they basically, once they've put all these like many assignments together, they end up realizing that they essentially have a research paper written. And so a lot of them will choose the research paper because they, they put it together that the research paper is um, written for you. Um, but then some of them wanna build it into something that looks more interactive, like a blog. And so there are other choices there. The other thing we're gonna add this year is we just got a great new 3D printer. And so we're gonna add something probably where they would 3D print pieces to a diorama or something like that, and then um, just video themselves telling why they chose to print those pieces. Um, so anyway, we're hoping to continue tweaking and adding to what we offer for students to choose from. Then the last piece there after they've created their product is that they would share it. And the first year we actually, we actually posted these um, one sheet teasers with a picture and then their QR code posted around the building. Well, then, of course, during COVID, we couldn't do this around the building kind of scavenger hunt style presentation. And so we ended up essentially they created the same one sheet graphic, but then it had their their paragraph teaser or two or three sentence teaser, their QR code and their picture. But then we posted them in um, a Google folder. And so when those were posted, students actually said they preferred that particular presentation because then they weren't limited to do it only during their English or literature class. They, they liked being able to spend more time looking at more of the projects than what they ended up being able to do just during class time. So I think if we do actually do the posting around the, the school, like we did the first year, we would probably also do the electronic posting. So it's been interesting to see the differences that we've kind of kept based on the changes we had to make because of COVID. So these are some of the projects that students created. And some of them, um, like I said, stayed with the one on the far right was more history about the Tulsa race massacre. Um, but then we had other students like wanted to use that general um, idea, but then like the girl right next to that, she wanted to know why do celebrities get to say things and racist things um, that other people are not allowed to say. Those are not things that we would commonly accept. So why do we accept that celebrities say these things? And then of course, then some of them went the opposite way, exploring like white privilege and that kind of thing. And then uh, I think on another page, there's one that talks about, uh, well, one that talked about uh, the, the gender gap in um, pay, but also, um, and here's the one about diversity training in companies and that kind of thing. So we'll look at those in just a minute. The other thing that students then, the very last thing they did is we had them reflect on the entire process. And we actually kept the questions in this Flipgrid is basically a video response um, app. And we asked them what worked, what surprised you, what did you learn about the topic or about doing research or about yourself as a learner or a researcher, and what would you change? 
The first two questions we kept kind of general because we kind of wanted them to interpret and answer um, whichever way they saw it. And you'll see from some of their videos that they did kind of go a little bit different way depending on how they interpreted the question. This first one is the one who did the one about celebrities being able to say things and we accept that things that we shouldn't say. Um, what worked for me was writing down notes so I could like stay organized. Um, something that surprised me is that how many steps there were in the process. And I learned that racism comes in like many different forms. And I would choose, one thing I would change is to pick a better topic. So she actually says she would pick a better topic. The reason she said that is she didn't find as much research as she would have liked to find. Honestly, I think this is like a college level research question and um, there's just not as much published as maybe she would have liked. And so it's interesting to me that, that she said she needed a better topic uh, when honestly, I think it's a great topic, but she just didn't find things to answer the question she was asking. This student did um, the treatment of Japanese Americans during right before or during World War II. My project worked out very well because I think I did really good at researching. And since I have a podcast, I was able to do the podcast well with my um, little app do with and all my gadgets that I use for my podcast. And then um, what surprised me was that. Um, I could talk for a very long time about a certain historic subject. And then I learned a lot about um, how the Japanese were discriminated in the 40s in the um, Japanese internment camps. And then I also learned that I can procrastinate some because there was a simple analysis where I wasn't going to be able to get my project in on time. And then um, I would definitely change um, my uh, topic and maybe not do a podcast next time, just try something else that was different, because I feel like I could have showcased it a bit better. Yeah. So she said she would change her topic when I, I think she meant she would change how she presented the topic, um, but maybe she meant she would change the topic. All right, this student investigated um, diversity training that companies use, and it's I think it's effectiveness. What worked for me was discussing with others about what ideas worked and what didn't. Uh, what surprised me was how many sources we needed. Uh, I learned that businesses are working towards better diversity programs. And what I would change next time is I would choose a, well, a more well-known topic. And I think he got some of the same uh, results that the first girl did that he, he didn't find all the research that he wished he could have. A word for me was the typing and the writing part, like first typing and then writing it. Um, what surprised me was that it actually went through, and I hope I did great on it. And um, the thing I learned was that not everything's going to be a success in life, and that if it doesn't go through, then um, I'd probably be like a really like I don't know, yeah. And <laughs> um, I probably change like the. To be honest, I wouldn't change anything. I like my assignment the way it is. So yeah. All right, all right. Then let's see. I do have some resources listed for you where you can go to first get background for yourself, uh, but you can also share 
a lot of these with your students. The John Hope Franklin Center has incredible um, resources for both um, ideas on presenting these types of topics, but also uh, they have a reconciliation, um, a whole part of their, their website. Uh, so it, it is a valuable resource. Then the Tulsa Historical Society has a virtual and traveling exhibit of the information, and that's a link to their virtual exhibit. But there, like I said, there are also, um, if you're in the state of Oklahoma, you can borrow these panels uh, from the, the Society Museum in Tulsa. Also then Tulsa Public Schools has an incredible repository of lessons for basically K through 12 to present in almost every subject. So they have art lessons, they have music lessons, they have of course English and history lessons, all curated at this particular site. And it's just a wealth of information. Then from the Yale National Initiative, they have a, a really big collection too of information there. And it's been very useful to me. The Restorative Justice Institute is in Tulsa and they offer basically um, programming for teachers to be able to use this type of information in your classroom, but then also to do it with integrity, realizing that there are students who would be triggered by some of this information, realizing that we need to be aware of ourselves as people and people with biases before we actually um, set out to uh, present these types of information to our students. And then I also included our outline for the unit. Then this is a list of the books that we're using now this year, because like I said, we have expanded to um, literature circles where students can choose which of the books they want to uh, read with a small group. And then we have, I have on here, the guided inquiry books, as well as the books that we're going to be teaching to the entire group. So like Dr. Hill's book is one that our whole group would also, um, would all do as far, and as well as the Weatherford book, which is the uh, race mask picture book that is winning tons of awards. And it's also written and illustrated by um, descendants of survivors. These are some links that may also help you. These is, are basically the links to the Guided Inquiry blog where uh, our group reflected on the unit and talked about what worked for us, some things that we basically had to tweak and change. And so these links go directly to some of the videos, but also some of the blog posts that several of our teachers wrote. And uh, I'm just hoping that by having these available to you that they would help you as you try to prepare this type of unit for your own classroom. And then I see we have some questions. Great, well, thank you so much, Carol, for walking us through um, your unit. We do have a question in the Q&A. Someone is wondering if examples of student work are posted online for other teachers to examine more closely. Yes, actually, in this um, slideshow, I have lots of their work uh, posted. I did not share any work where a parent had not, like, wanted their child's information posted. So any of those that are shared, a parent has signed off that their information could be shared. If anyone else has any questions, um, please feel free to drop those into the Q&A or the chat window now. We do have some more time left in our webinar to take more questions. Um, and I do see um, someone is wondering where we can get the slide. So I will post that link back into the chat. Um, the uh -oh. You're muted, Elena. <laughs> Thank you. The slides are posted on the Programming Librarian website page, so I will uh, post that into the chat. Um, and the webinar recording will also be available on that same page within 48 hours of this session. Awesome. Great.
I'm looking through the chat now to see if I missed any questions. Um, so if you did ask a question, please feel free to post it again if we didn't see it. Um, okay, somebody's saying they need permission. So let me make that change. Um, was it the unit plan that she said wasn't letting her? Um, Cassandra, if you could say specifically which resource that was, that would be very helpful. Um, or if it's the slides. Okay. While we figure that out, I do see there's another question about the presentation. Um, someone is wondering if you have any pushback from parents about violence or anti-racism being taught. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the we have not actually had pushback from parents about that, but we do actually send um, notice that that we would be covering it, and. Um, we're pretty careful about which um, resources we use as far as videos and stuff like that. So like the Watchman has um, a pretty good uh, intro to one of their uh, episodes. And, uh, but we do warn them ahead of time that, you know, obviously it's a, a violent piece of history. So, but that's a great question. We have not had parents who, who are worried about that. Um, if anything, it's been more the opposite, that they're glad we're covering it because they're um, just appalled that it wasn't covered when they were in school. And so a lot of the parents, like the kids go home every day and tell them exactly what they covered that day. And so many of the parents have been quite the opposite. They're just um, appreciative that we're covering it. And I see it seems like it's the QR code on page 17. So we can take a look at that. Okay. Thank you for giving us that information. If there are any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A window. Again, we, we have some more time here. Um, someone is wondering how much of the projects are based around the Tulsa race massacre and how many are based around the individual topics the kids come up with. Um, so is um, I would say it's probably in the 20 ish range 20% 15 to 20% maybe stay with the massacre, mainly because like I said, the parents have been so engaged with it because they did not hear about this in their um, schooling. And again, because the, uh, the state as a whole and Tulsa made sure it was covered up for so long. We had teachers on our team who were just appalled that they didn't learn it in school. And so I think some of the kids, especially the ones whose parents wanna hear about it every day when they come home from school so that they can find out what else the, the child learned. Um, some of those, those um, students, I think because there's been so much buy-in from their parents, they, they wanna continue with the research themselves. Um, but then there's others that, that it kind of just spurs them to, to look into something else. So I'd say around 20% stay with the massacre or something related to it. And again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A or the chat. We do have some more time left in our session here, so we're happy to take any more questions you might have. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, came to today's webinar and participated. Um, I know there were a few comments about permissions on the different resources that are available, so we'll make sure to check all of that, make sure that you can access all of the resources that Carol shared with us today yeah. um, and have those available for you. Um, I do see that we have another question in the chat. Um, any pointers in what topics we could cover in our own schools? Do we talk with teachers? Um, so if you have any sort of recommendations or suggestions for getting started with a similar program. 
Um, I would honestly say it depends on maybe the age of your, your students, but also um, your location in the country. If you're specifically interested in something like this, um, sadly, there was lots and lots of instances in the 20s. Um, I think it was between 1918 and 1923 um, when there were, there were many of similar instances. Um, I know in Florida and in Nebraska and uh, several places in the Southeast where um, there were just for various reasons, like here in um, Oklahoma, it was related to there was um, a downturn or a recession in the oil market. And so I, part of that is the reasoning that they, they feel like maybe that was the timing of this particular kind of uprising. Yes, Elaine, Arkansas, thank you. Um, but I would maybe start with the whatever instance is closest to you. Um, I do know Dr. Hill also just came out with an Emmett Till graphic um, novel, which is uh, very impactful. So if, if you're closer to one of those two areas, either Illinois or uh, Mississippi, you may want to look at something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, yes. History, Oklahoma History Day. I, Clara was one of the students, or not Oklahoma History Day, um, NHD, but also OHD. Uh, Clara has actually won at the state level a couple of times and um, just is an incredible researcher. So, uh, yeah, it was interesting to hear her kind of reflection and evaluation of herself. We have just a few minutes left, so any final questions, please feel free to post those in the Q&A or the chat. Um, we do have a question here, on what criteria are you assessing students and how does it build to their next research project? Okay, um, on the choice board, you'll see that um, there is a rubric on each one of the presentation pieces they have, and we use um, the standards, both library standards and um, the English grade level eight standards. Uh, so students know ahead of time what it is that is being looked for in their product or in their uh, documentation of their process. So um, because part of some of the grades for English and literature anyway is them actually the process they followed. So it, it really kind of depends on which piece is being graded, um, but we try to break it down and, and chunk it for them so that one, they have lots of grades that apply to this because this is a lot of work. And it does actually, um, we, we feel like we can see a difference in how they do things in history and in English um, after they've gone through the process. And their end products have been all over the place. We, like I said, we don't limit them to um, history or the Tulsa Race Massacre or anything like that. So some of them have actually gone out and like interviewed the homeless people in our town because he wanted to address like mis misconceptions about homeless people. But then other students wanted to address like um, why people assume that like video gaming is not good for you. And so he did this whole research project on the value of video gaming and things like that. So we really don't limit them in what it is that they're researching. You guys are welcome and I am available for any questions that you might have, especially if you start to do something like this and then uh, get stuck. 
I don't see any more questions in the Q&A in chat right now. So before we get to the end of the hour, I do just want to say thank you so much um, to Carol Jones for sharing this um, really impactful project with us and with the community through this webinar and for sharing all of these uh, resources related to the project. Um, as a reminder, we are recording this session, so we will have this uh, recording posted on the Programming Librarian webpage for this webinar within 48 hours of today's session. Um, and that same site is also where you can find a link to the PowerPoint slides, as well as that resource document that has more links to um, the different project resources. Um, if you do have any final questions, please let us know. Otherwise, you can reach out to us at publicprograms at ala.org. And I know Carol also dropped her email into the chat if you have any specific questions about implementing a similar program at your school library. Um, with, so with that, I would just like to say thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. And thank you again to Carol. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. My pleasure. Thanks for coming.